Welcome everyone, it's the Crypto Lark, and today I am here in the heart of government in New Zealand, down at our parliament, we call it the Beehive. I'm going to be meeting with Gareth Hughes. He is a Green Party MP. We're gonna be discussing blockchain in New Zealand. Let's get into it. It is my great honor to have on today, Gareth Hughes, Green Party MP here in New Zealand. We're gonna be diving into blockchain in New Zealand. Gareth, welcome. Yeah, kia ora, like. Thank you for having me. Great to have you on. Now, I think the first place to start off is, do you own any cryptocurrency? No, I don't. I really wish I'd bought some years ago, because it'd probably be worth a lot more than I would have paid for it. Uh, but no, I don't. What about your kids? Um, no, my kids are only um, uh, 11, so I guess they could have some secret Bitcoin <laughs> stashed somewhere. Um, most of their money is going on uh, Fortnite dance moves, though, anyway. Ah, I see. There you go. Fortnite's very, very popular these days. You might be surprised. Your kids might be mining Ethereum on your computer at home. <laughs> they'll, they'll be, in five years, they'll say, Dad, we're rich. <laughs> now, in a more serious uh, question, I suppose, what is the Green Party's stance on cryptocurrencies and blockchain, or does the Green Party have a stance on this new technology? Yeah, so we don't have formal policy. Our policy is developed by our members. But what we do have is general policy around IT, around you know, uh, economic and monetary reform. Mm -hmm. And I think that's consistent and um, supportive because what you do see with, I mean, let's take, you know, um, uh, fintech stuff. Uh, blockchain has a real opportunity to, to save consumers money, to promote security, privacy, um, transparency where that's required. So, look, it's, an, it's a tremendously exciting space and we're following it with interest. I think we will have to develop formal blockchain policy in the future though. Yeah, I think that um, any country who kind of doesn't get a stance on it will get left behind. Yeah. I mean, there's so many countries who are diving deep into cryptocurrency at the moment. So that's the Green Party and, and the government as a whole hasn't taken a position on it yet either in the same way. Yeah, and I think I know other commentators, um, James Abraham and QC, for example, were saying we, we have been quite slow. You know, we tend to have a bit of a more permissive regime in New Zealand, allowing it to happen unless it's uh, prohibited or ultimately regulated. Mm -hmm. But we do have such an opportunity. When you look across the digital Australia, there you've got the interaction between the federal government, the state government, and the US, you've got that maximized, of course, by the Supreme Court. So there's all these blocks and barriers and opportunities for things to be litigated in court. Mm -hmm. Being a unicameral parliament, only having a single house, uh, no states to deal with. You know, if we chose to embrace this, we really um, could move, uh, I guess, in a real agile fashion. And so, uh, it, with that in mind, and that's that's one of the beauties of New Zealand government. There's not, it's easier to get things done here. And with that in mind, though, why hasn't anything been done yet? What is it? Um, maybe lack of interest by the government, or perhaps just kind of a wait and see approach, see what everyone else is doing. Yeah, well, I can't speak for the government, but I think yep. it has been a bit of a wait and see approach. Um, waiting for you know technology to develop to, to such point where it needs to be regulated. Mm -hmm. But I would point out the government has been acting. I know Callaghan uh, gave a three hundred and thirty thousand dollar grant uh, in terms of blockchain. I think that was for a cryptocurrency. That was for and, a, a Bitcoin uh, related company. It's about yep. last about last week, I think, actually. Yep. Yep. Uh, the Financial Markets Authority has been uh, undertaking studies into it. So there has been some work, uh, not to the degree of you know say Malta, but. Um, I think it's a very sympathetic government that wants to sort of wait and see what's happening. But look, from a Green Party perspective, I think there is a real opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, those opportunities will be jumped on, you know, will, whether it be, you know, now or in a couple of years, uh, New Zealand government will you know, move in that direction uh, or it will get left behind. And that's not what New Zealand is all about, I think, when it comes down to it. But I guess the other side of you know, the crypto coin is that it's the industry, or, the, the system is self-regulating itself to a degree anyway. And As well. A, a question we'll be asking ourselves, I think, in 10 years' time is uh, what role for national sovereign governments in terms of regulation when this is happening at a global level much faster than regulators probably can deal with anyway? So it's grappling with that uh, rapidly changing technological pace. That's a really good point, actually, and it is really difficult from everything I've uh, read and seen that regulators are having a tricky time keeping up with this because this technology is changing at a 
really a breakneck pace. And for me as a commentator on the space, it's hard for me to keep up and I live and breathe it all the time. And oh my gosh, there's more new things coming out. So for a regulator who has 10,000 other things to worry about, it can be very, very tricky indeed. Yeah, and I think in terms of the general public consciousness, it's been defined by Bitcoin and people see the price mm -hmm. spikes and the speculation and think that's the extent of it when we know, of course, it's, it's a much deal richer and more complex than that. That's right. It's just the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Now, um, renewable energy is obviously something that the Green Party is famous for, uh, for championing environmental issues. There is a lot of opportunity here for um, blockchain technology to work with that renewable space in terms of, you know, smart meters or peer-to-peer -peer trading, microtransactions of only pennies selling solar from your roof or whatever it might be. Is there any interest from the Green Party to be, I guess, welcoming these kind of companies into New Zealand to help decentralize our power grid here? You know, as, as we know, it's an earthquake prone country and the, we can have grid and electricity problems from time to time as a result of that, so. Yeah, absolutely. So recently I was uh, fortunate enough to open a new solar powered school down in um, South Otago. There the surplus solar was being traded amongst the community. Now it wasn't a blockchain based environment, but this is very much the direction energy is going. Instead of the centralized one direction, we're getting mm -hmm. bi-directional power flows. Uh, and what you need to do is have a back-end system which is able to deal with that in a, uh, an instantaneous, given that the electrons are moving at almost the speed of light, yep. uh, and a, in a secure fashion. And that's where I think blockchain is uniquely suited and has such advantages. So I think you're going to see it in the energy space. Um, there's a great opportunity for New Zealand to lead. Um, being such a renewably powered country, uh, big challenges, the, the yep. earthquakes, but also you know, we're a long stringy country, uh, it's very expensive to move power from one side of the country to the other, mm -hmm. we waste a huge amount. The, the answers to the problems we're facing are the problems other countries are dealing with as well. So we could be exporting the ideas, the intellectual property, the services. We're never going to export you know, our wind power, our hydro power to Australia or nope. anywhere else, but we could be exporting the solutions. And ultimately, a lot of the power solutions are IT solutions. So it's the backing stuff that I think is going to be more valuable. That's right. I guess in the energy space, though, you know, I'm, I've been asked by the media previously, is Bitcoin and is blockchain bad for the environment? Which is quite an interesting debate when I understand Bitcoin alone accounts for the power demand of Ireland. But there's also another argument, which I think is often discounted, that we're ignoring all the existing inefficient IT yep. emissions. I think globally IT emissions are around 10% of global greenhouse gas pollution. And when you're using these ancient legacy computers, which mm -hmm. a lot of our power companies do use still in New Zealand, I think for me it's an example where we could be using things a lot more efficiently and that's where I think blockchain comes in. Absolutely, absolutely. With Bitcoin, I know that a lot of the uh, Bitcoin mines, so to speak, are actually put in regions where there's an, a surplus of energy, like in central Russia, for example. Not a lot of people, lots of energy, but it, it's definitely a, a conversation to be had in terms of energy efficiency. and. For anyone who doesn't know, actually New Zealand is really one of the world's premier countries in terms of renewables. And what's our current percentage approximately of renewables here in New Zealand? Yeah, so we're about 84% renewable. It depends you know, how wet the year is, given we're so hydro uh, dependent. But um, I'm incredibly proud from a Green Party perspective that we've got a 100% renewable target by 2035. You know, we've got about a third to half of our existing generation already consented for new renewables. We've got a huge amount of untapped wind resource with being called the Saudi Arabia of wind. Uh, <laughs> uh, huge untapped solar potential. So we've got uh, a bright future in terms of renewables going forward. You know, we, we can get to 100%. And you know, um, again, you know, from, from data centers, mining could be our future. Mm -hmm. We've seen in the last two decades the decline of our traditional mining industry. You know, I think there is a chance that we could see you know, future mining yeah, space. that's right. That's right. Cryptocurrency mining could be uh, what's, well, you know, the new gold, so to speak, in, in some ways. So it's very, very interesting to see all this coming together in terms of technology and it offers a lot of opportunities for anyone who can jump on board that. And I think the renewable uh, sector is just absolutely massive. And for anyone who doesn't know, actually, 
Wellington is the windiest city in the world, so we definitely have a surplus of wind here, without well, a doubt. On, on a net basis, Wellington City is powered entirely by the wind on a net annual basis, which I think is wonderful. That's amazing. But we've only got 5% of our country's generation comes from wind. We could easily get up to 20%. Yeah. But um, you know, as, a, as a, a lawmaker, this is a question I still haven't been able to find online, is what are the, the net environmental impacts of, say, cryptocurrency mining? You see in the US, I think there's a state, was it in New Jersey or New York, which is banning Bitcoin mining in yeah. the jurisdiction. Uh, is it a net positive or is it a net drain on terms uh, of global power grids? Yeah, well, it's certainly an interesting question. If there's excess energy and no one's using it, it's a good use for it. You can yep. generate uh, income that way. And there's been a lot of actually charity applications of people mining for charity, for example. But um, if you have it say we put a bunch of miners in central Wellington, well, they're competing for the power, and then you have, there's actually been a lot of situations of fly-by-night miners where they come in and fill up, rent a house, fill it up with uh, computers, and you know, burn the house down because yeah. they put too many computers on the grid. So there's, there's some interesting problems that do come in there, but there's a lot of opportunity for uh, that as well. Now, to move the for conversation forward a little bit, blockchain and democracy, this is something that's been a really hot topic recently. In terms of voting, do you think that voting and blockchain could actually be a good combination together? Yeah, well, and when you look at the existing alternative, in New Zealand we still deal with postal voting, which is eminently easy to hack when you're dealing <laughs> yeah. with uh, physical letters. We've seen massive uh, controversies and problems uh, in the states with their, in some cases, archaic voting practices mm -hmm. and machines which are easily hacked. I want to get to a future where we could see online voting. I think that's going to encourage um, more electoral participation. It means Parliament to become more decentralised. We can ask the public more often on key issues instead of the only say being once every three years. But the problem of traditional online voting is the security. Yeah, now, a what, centralised database. That's the problem. What this allows is something you know, where that data is immutable, uh, it's secure, and you know, depending on the system, virtually impossible to hack. So, That's right. Uh, look, it's exciting seeing countries, I think the states like West Virginia, I think, is experimenting or exploring it at the moment. I think it's very much the future, the direction we're going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I say bring it on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm really happy to hear, to hear you saying that because it, it, in terms of like referendums, for example, this is such a big potential use case. I mean, real, real participatory democracy where, you know, the government can come out with an idea and say, well, what does everyone think about this? Let's vote on it as a country. And it doesn't have to be that three-year ballot box kind of thing. It can be an app on your phone. And that has a lot of power to it, to have that kind of easy access with the public and the easy ability to vote on perhaps key issues that if you wait 18 months to vote on this, that's a lot of time for a yeah. lot of issues. Well, when you look at the status quo in New Zealand, we've got such an old-fashioned referendum law, so you need to get 10% of the adult enrolled population to remember their address, to sign the little bit of paper exactly correctly, mm -hmm. and do it within 12 months, and only spend $50,000 doing it. It's no surprise that only four referenda have ever achieved that high threshold, and then all four of them have been ignored by the government of the day. So it, it's clearly not working, and we should be using new technology to make it easier and the main argument against it has been that security, the risk of hacking, uh, the risk of the data being exposed. Mm -hmm. This, you know, is that solution to it. That's right. And there, there's the solution. All these things are uh, solved. We have encrypted data. We have an unhackable system and all these different things. So it's, it's, uh, it's a question now of, as we said before, regulators catching up and hopping on board with that new technology. Now, in terms of, I guess, um, the actual regulation of this technology. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a constantly changing field. And it's, I know it's really difficult for the, um, the regulators to actually come in and say, okay, well, we want to put some regulations on top of that. Do you think that this has, blockchain technology has a pretty similar parallel to other new technologies that we see coming around, or do you think it's a kind of a special case? Uh, you say no, I guess. So take um, autonomous vehicles. They have a very clear safety element. Mm -hmm. There is a, a role for regulation. Take electric vehicles, I mean, something not often recognised as the safety and fire risk when those cars crash. So there's a role for government to regulate in those spaces. So ostensibly, no, should the government just let uh, blockchain cryptocurrencies go do their thing? But when you look at the impact of financial stability, that's where I think there is a real important role for government to play a role. 
you know, with some initial coin offerings. Yeah, we're talking billions of dollars, mm -hmm. real world money, uh, and potential impacts on the wider financial and economic sector. So yes, I think the government does have to play a role to make sure that you know what is happening is legally. What you don't want to have is an unfair regime to protect incumbents. Mm -hmm. Now, for say existing banks or moving money around the world. Um, there's a lot of money at stake for them to protect their existing business models. So what we want to have is a regime that uh, encourages innovation and doesn't discourage disruptive enterprises. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's a very, very fine balance to walk. I know in the United States they've gone more of a, a very protective route, whereas recently in Australia they've said, well, we're very open to the idea of initial coin offerings, um, assuming that they comply with you know, Australian regulation. And so I believe here in New Zealand, the, um, the FMA has come out and said, well, if it looks like a security and smells like a security, it's probably a security and people should be aware of that. But we haven't actually seen a lot of, um, of these initial coin offerings being worried about New Zealanders or the New Zealand government being very worried about them. Do you think that we might see a move towards, uh, I guess, an increase in concern for these kind of fundraising efforts? Yeah, I think we will. I mean, when you look at our share market compared to Australia's, a key barrier of New Zealand startups is access to capital, and our share market is dominated by a few large players. It's often not used as a place for, for um, people who are going to venture capital instead. So I think there'll be it's quite attractive to Kiwis, but then I guess there's a question of a lack of data. I mean, how many Kiwis are actually participating in mm, the global marketplace? That's right. I'm not aware of any information regarding that. It might be substantial. That's right, or it might not be substantial, sure. and that's, that's the trick with um, a lot of these cryptocurrencies is you can see the money moving around, but you don't know who that is or where that is and who is actually participating in these sales. And of course, the companies aren't releasing the data of, well, we had 3% of New Zealanders in this sale. So there is definitely a trick in how much of a question is it actually. I mean, some people are doing it, but is it enough that the government needs to worry and think, okay, well, we may need to make sure we're protecting investors and all these different things at the same time. Yeah, and I guess I struggle to think who would be the appropriate entity in New Zealand to do a review into it. Uh, perhaps it's the Productivity Commission to take a sort of wide-ranging view of everything from the impact on the agricultural economy, you know, fintech, mm -hmm. uh, currencies. That's right, and when we start to look at um, you know expanding out the idea of blockchain a little bit at a uh, supply chain management, for example, there's just so many use cases. I mean, New Zealand is a massive agricultural exporter. You know, our, our kiwis go all over the world, not just the people, but the fruit, and that could all be on the blockchain in terms of you know product quality, sh shipping, and you know increase efficiencies with bills of lading and all these different things and international payments for those. So there's a lot of opportunity there for a an export. Uh, oriented economy like New Zealand to utilize this technology to save businesses in New Zealand more money. Well, I'd say it's critical too because we're a country which trades on our brand, on quality, mm -hmm. on safety. Uh, I mean, we've, we've seen a classic example in the last two years with Mycoplasma bovis, a, a terrible cattle disease which is wiping out, I think, between 30 and 50,000 cows. So, wow. a huge impact. It's costing the tax about $800 million. Part of the problem was that there was an animal tracing tool, the National Animal Identification Tracing uh, online tool. It was so cumbersome and talking to farmers so difficult as a user to mm -hmm. actually use that uh, a huge number of animals just weren't inputted into the system. Now, using a blockchain system, I can imagine where it would be an immediate change of the records. Yep, and scanned of, it on your phone. Yep, instead of you know filling out forms, uploading them, um, both buyer and seller doing different things at different times. It could have been done once, done right, and that information would have been immediately uploaded and immediately accessible if it was needed. So yes from an animal safety perspective, but also yes from a quality branding uh, traceability perspective. You know, we could be telling our consumers exactly what paddock that cow came from. Uh, I've got a, a bill which I'm hoping which will pass in two weeks time, which is requiring country of origin food labelling on uh, a majority of food products in New Zealand. An argument from food producers, it's too expensive to get the mm -hmm. information. That is true, using old-fashioned legacy systems. Uh, in the future, I don't think that will be the case. That's right, and that's right. And I think a lot of these um, companies are scared because they're only used to their legacy systems. They know that, wow, if we have to do this new thing, it's going to cost us a lot of money. They're not looking, if we have a new solution, it might actually save us money. And that's, that's where the power is. And there's an old saying, you know, no one ever lost their job from choosing IBM. <laughs> there 
there you go. There you go. Well, to finish up our, our chat here today, just a bit of a forward-looking question, I suppose. Where do you see New Zealand moving in the future with this? Do you think we're actually going to see increased adoption and regulation? Or do you see any potential fears that maybe the New Zealand government might go kind of the opposite way and say, oh, we don't really want to be part of that new technology? I think really the question for New Zealand is how much and how fast do we embrace it to, to try and benefit and gain a sort of first mover advantage. It's coming whether we like it or not. Obviously it's here whether we like it or not. You know, um, Bitcoin's having a huge impact uh, on, on financial systems, on energy systems, but the opportunities, how we use it for health records, for agricultural mm -hmm. tracing, uh, for using it for our democracy. So it, it is an opportunity. I think we have been a bit uh, typical Kiwi and slow about it. But we do have an opportunity if we move uh, fast in an agile fashion. So I think the public needs to be more informed about it. I think when you only view it from a news headline Bitcoin perspective, it does seem very uh, new and foreign, but actually the applications are, are wide, varied, and incredibly powerful and important. So my message is that we need to embrace it. We need to do more thinking about it. We need to make sure that regulation is not discouraging it mm -hmm. or protecting incumbents. Uh, but this is um, a, a, an amazing new technology which is going to change the world. Absolutely. Well said. Gareth, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Thank you.